Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for taking the time to attend today. <clears throat> My voice will croak because I'm very nervous, but I shall do the best I can to make sure that you can hear me. I think after watching the film, the question really is, is quite apparent, is it? Who can we trust? Who can we trust to actually look after our health today, and who could we trust in the 1960s and 70s? Well, in the 1960s and 70s, our trust in the medical profession and government agencies was absolute, but unfortunately, sadly misplaced. We felt so lucky to escape the horror of thalidomide. We were completely reassured that this could never happen again. We had doctors we trusted without question, doctors who would be extra vigilant when prescribing drugs in pregnancy. We had a government who, after thalidomide, set up a watchdog committee, again, as mentioned in the film, specifically to monitor the safety of drugs, but with particular emphasis on drugs in pregnancy. We had the World Health Organization, founded on concerns of international public health, who were also aware of the tragic failures with thalidomide. We had the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry, the ABPI, whose role was defined as to develop, manufacture and sell drugs. Their mission was not to define illness, but to target diseases defined previously by the medical profession. We were willing to trust the ABPI, as they were also aware of the failures of the pharma company Grunenthal, and their drug, thalidomide. Unfortunately, once again, our trust in all these org organisations was grossly misplaced. On attending our doctors to find out if we were pregnant, we were unaware. Our doctors had defined our pregnancy as a disease, which required drugs. So why would they do this? We were perfectly healthy. We didn't suffer from morning sickness. We needed no therapeutic interventions and non-invasive tests were readily available. So why were we given an untested drug which contained 10 milligrams of norethistone acetate and 0.02 milligrams of ethanol estradiol? These were synthetic hormones also contained in oral contraceptives, but at 40 times the strength in those two tablets. Could the reason be financial remuneration for the drug company and financial incentives to our doctors? As was mentioned on the film, it was incentivised. If a benefit risk assessment had been completed, the results would have shown benefits for the drug company and the doctors and the government because it was cheaper, but the only risks were to us. If doctors were aware of the components of HPTs and that they were also in oral contraceptives, why did they ignore the Hippocratic Oath, which states, again as mentioned on the film, first do no harm? Why prescribe this high dosage, untested drug when there were non-invasive tests already available? Could the answer be the incentivization offered to the doctors, or could it be the drug company did not disclose the other use for primidos, which would go on to be used for abortion. It is incredible that a drug used as a pregnancy test was also used in many countries as an abortifacient, particularly in countries where abortion was illegal. And we do know that those drugs were still being sent to Ireland in 1978 at 1,000 packets a month. The government health care agencies, whose mandate was to monitor drugs and adverse reactions, also failed in their duty of care by actively suppressing warnings they received about HPTs. The first warning, again as mentioned, was in 1958, and the really pertinent sentence in that was the type of insult likely to cause fetal malformations. This warning was actually followed by many more independent warnings from doctors and scientists, yet the committees decided they would take no action to alert the medical community. 
Also suppressed, again as mentioned, was the in-depth study by Dr Isabel Gall. The study was dismissed as inconclusive by Dr William Inman, who was the medical director of the Committee on Safety of Medicines. Instead, Dr Inman referred to Dr Gall as a sad little woman and described a meeting with her as exhausting as she tried to convince him of the dangers to pregnant women. You should be aware, as you will see from the film, that Dr Gall was a highly qualified and dedicated doctor who actually took the Hippocratic Oath twice and practiced by its code every single day. Dr Inman also responded to Dr Gall's study by writing, with so much more important work to be done, I cannot summon up the energy to make further investigations. So why would that be? Could it be that Dr Inman was linked closely to the drug company Shearings, manufacturers of the largest selling oral contraceptive pill, also manufacturers of Primados, the highest selling hormone pregnancy test? Evidence had already surfaced which questioned the safety of oral contraceptives. Evidence which documented an increase in deaths, a high increase in deaths and severe disabilities in women who were taking the pill. This evidence was brought to the attention of the government health authorities in 1965. But only in November 1967 did the CSM send reports to the Ministry of Health who, of course, just denied on screen Roland Moyles that he was ever told anything. They actually sent that to him in 1967 to discuss informally what action should be taken. In the same way concerns about HPTs were suppressed, evidence about the dangers of oral contraceptives were also not disclosed to the medical profession. Instead, Dr Inman elected to work with shearing scientists to reduce the dosage of oral contraceptives. Only after the dosage was reduced and their safety considered satisfactory were doctors informed of the dangers their patients had faced. Again, that was mainly because of uh, publicity in the media. In recognition of Dr Immen's work with Shearing's oral contraceptive pill, he was given the title Father of the Mini Pill. I won't make any comment on that. Due to the problems experienced with the birth control pill, it was considered essential that evidence about the safety of Primados was suppressed. Primados contained exactly the same components as the oral contraceptive and evidence was growing. It was growing that Primados may be responsible for malformations and miscarriages. Disclosure of the link would be disastrous for Shearings and the Committee on Safety of Medicines, as it would focus attention on the previously suppressed adverse effects of oral contraceptives. This disclosure could also affect the population control programme planned by the World Health Organisation. And, not least, it would have a huge impact on profits for shearing. Therefore, the decision was taken to ignore studies and documents supporting the suspicion about Primados. Unbelievably, again as mentioned, this was suppressed for eight years, and that was collusion between Dr Inman and Shearings, particularly the head office in Berlin. This course of action was taken despite Dr Inman admitting in writing, again as mentioned, that there was a prima facie case that HPTs caused malformations, further adding we are defenceless in the eight year delay. <clears throat> also dismissed during this time were letters written to Shearing Berlin from Shearing UK, and again the film did touch on those, but those letters were written in June 1968. February 1969, July 1969, all begging Shearing to take the drug off the market. And again, it was quite unequivocal, Primidos needs to be withdrawn. Also, there are growing concerns and evidence regarding its safety. That was Shearing's own scientists. 
What they also did was to contact Dr Inman to ask him to please add his support to remove Primados from the market. His response was to refuse to add his support and instead write to Shearings in Berlin, advising them, this is his own words, in my opinion, I can see no reason to take Primados off the market. Also dismissed by the CSM were results of a study from the Royal College of General Practitioners which fully supported the concerns of Shearing UK scientists. And again, that was referenced in the, um, the, the documentary. Uh, there was a 60, nearly 17% incidence of abnormalities with Primados for that particular study of women as opposed to about eight point something percent for the whole of the population of Scotland. So that again was quite a, a definite conclusion, but again dismissed. And to compound this act of deliberate negligence by Dr. Inman, he contacted Shearing AG in Berlin to warn them he had found a five to one chance of malformations in his own study on Primados. This advance warning to Shearing was three months before he was forced to alert the medical profession after an expose in the Sunday Times. Why would a government official with the responsibility of safeguarding our health do this? Dr Inman's reasons are contained in a transcript, again, of his own words. He wanted to give Shearing a chance to avoid claims of medical negligence by giving the company the opportunity to discreetly withdraw the product from the market before sending out a warning notice to the medical community. He had destroyed or made unidentifiable the entire material used in his study so it would be impossible to trace and use the individual cases. He wanted Shearing to subpoena him to give evidence to support Shearing in the litigation in 1981 brought by the Association for Children Damaged by Hormone Pregnancy Tests. He intended to give evidence against the association by denigrating the finding in his own study. Due to Dr Inman's position as a government official, he was not allowed to appear as an expert witness unless subpoenaed, so that was the motivation. Dr Inman was subpoenaed and his, his evidence was used against the association. This was the ultimate betrayal of his position as a government health official, but was it also a criminal offence? Dr Inman had disclosed sensitive and confidential information to Shearings about the results of his own study and asked to be subpoenaed to give evidence on their behalf. In section 18 of the 1968 Safety of Medicines Act, it states, it is an offence for any person to disclose to any other person any information furnished to him in pursuance of the Act, unless the disclosure was made in the performance of his duty. Dr Inman's duty was to safeguard our health, not to protect the interests of the drug company. Now, although Dr Inman didn't act alone, obviously, as you can see from Roland Moyles, the, the whole culture of the uh, various committees was the same. In failing to protect us, his actions in suppressing and destroying evidence made him and the government agencies involved ultimately responsible for the failures to safeguard our health. Our trust in these government agencies to safeguard um, was not only misplaced, but completely destroyed. The World Health Organization, known as the WHO, also failed in their safeguarding. As mentioned previously, the WHO expressed concerns that women would stop taking oral contraceptives if they were made aware of the growing evidence of malformations attributed to the HPTs. If women stopped taking the pill, it would have a significant impact on the world population. Therefore, the WHO did not object to suppression of this information. Although they didn't deliberately suppress it, they didn't stop the suppression. 
They also failed Dr Gall, who repeatedly appealed to them for funding to continue with her research into the dangers of hormone pregnancy tests. The funding for this vital research was refused. Coincidentally, coincidentally of course, Shearing's chief medical scientist, Dr Michael Briggs, was an advisor to the World Health Organization. It may seem strange that we also place our trust in the ABPI, but why would we envisage an organization aware of the damage caused by thalidomide manufactured by one of their own members would fail in their responsibility to closely monitor future adverse reactions? The ABPI attended many of the meetings with the health committees and were well aware of the issues with Primados and Shearing's oral contraceptive pill, yet they did not act on any of this information. So, of course, this invites the question, who can we trust today to safeguard our health? Unsurprisingly, the answer is absolutely no one. We can no longer have blind trust in our doctors, we can no longer, we need to be extra vigilant when any medicines are prescribed. We can no longer place our trust in the ABPI, who failed to implement any safeguards despite numerous publications, including studies, highlighting serious concerns about the safety of HPTs. They also failed to report on suspected adverse reactions. They failed to continually assess the risk benefits of hormone pregnancy tests. They did not alert the medical profession about the adverse effects of drugs. They did not acknowledge there was only risk and no benefit to prescribing HPT to pregnant women. They suppressed vital evidence on malformations, miscarriages and stillbirths attributed to HPTs, together with evidence relating to deaths and disability from oral contraceptives. Instead, they placed the financial benefits of the pharmaceutical company and the government above the safety of expectant mothers, with the result that many women had their hopes of motherhood destroyed, and many more live today and every day with the heartbreaking results of their children's disabilities. Unbelievably, the CSM were not the only government health authority determined to protect the drug company. The BGA, the German Federal Health Agency, today called BFARM, also went to great lengths to protect shearing. A senior official with the BGA called himself and the German authority advocates for shearing. He wanted Shearing to provide him with any studies they could find which did not show abnormalities. He was due to attend a meeting to discuss the safety of Duganon, which is the German name for Primados, and needed the information to prevent a decision to take Duganon off the market in Germany. Unless Shearing were able to show that they were approved to sell Duganon in Germany, their home country, they would not be allowed to market the drug in any other countries throughout the world. The withdrawal of Duganon would have a catastrophic effect on Shearing's profits. Therefore, an advocate for Shearing in the BGA, who would ensure the drug continued to be licensed in Germany, was invaluable. It has been suggested that financial remuneration for this level of support from members of the BGA would be considerable. It is an indisputable fact that Shearing AG and Shearing UK had full knowledge of the serious concerns and documented evidence relating to Primados. For example, testing results of their own studies in their own laboratories by their own scientists showing abnormalities and embryo lethal effects on animals. Letters, as we've mentioned before, from their scientists in the UK about the lack of proof of safety and repeated requests for withdrawal. Numerous well-designed and credible studies published throughout the world and found in Shearing's own files. They were aware of the litigation brought against a company called Squib & Co and their drug guest test, a drug which is almost identical to Primados, which resulted in a multi-million dollar settlement in the USA. How do we know Shearing were aware of the legal action in Wyoming? 
because shearing scientists attended the hearing in America every single day. So how did Sheeran respond to all this evidence, which is quite conclusive, as you can understand? Well, what they did, they insisted on proof of a causal link, despite the drug being contraindicated and therefore considered unethical for use on pregnant women. Again, Shearing's own words. Shearing consulted with lawyers who had been involved in the thalidomide trial and after consultation proceeded to instruct an extremely expensive legal team, rumoured to be in the cost of about half a million. They refused to accept the opinion of one of the world's leading embryologists. Again, Shearing's own words, a man called Professor Tootman de Plessy, hired by Shearing to assess the evidence against them. Professor du Plessy gave the following opinions. These are just a small amount of his opinions. Number one, Shearing should have done more, especially after suspicion of teratogenic potential was expressed by several investigators. Shearing should have most certainly carried out teratological studies in primates in 1968 after discovering that a certain dose was embryo-lethal in rabbits and rats. Professor Duplessis' final advice was, there is no doubt you will be found guilty because you have not done enough. So how did she react to this unequivocal opinion? By instructing a public relations firm to produce a dossier on Mr Jack Ashley MP and all 170 MPs who were members of his cross-party group. Mr Ashley was successfully raising questions in Parliament and had requested a public inquiry. Shearing documents reveal concerns that if the number of MPs may reach 200, this could trigger agreement for a public inquiry, which again, as you can see from Roland Moyles, they just did not want to have. <clears throat> but this dossier contains information on each MP, every single one, including their standing in Parliament, and just one comment is on Dennis Skinner, the Beast of Bolsover. And that ends with just two words, completely incorruptible. Now, I leave you to form your own conclusion on the purpose of this dossier. These actions were from a drug company <clears throat> who presented an image of the highest integrity, yet were prepared to stoop to the lowest level by digging for information on respected members of parliament. Shearing, now Bayer Shearing, is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and consequently they think they're unassailable. <coughs> Excuse me. So what safeguards do we have today? Well, we have the Commission on Human Medicines, a committee of medicines and healthcare and products regulatory agency formed in 2005. They assumed the responsibilities of the Committee on Safety of Medicines and the Medicines Commission. Can we trust they will learn from the terrible failures of the past and ensure these failures are addressed and never allowed to happen again? We also have pharmacovigilance, also known as drug safety, whose terms of reference are collection, detection, assessment, monitoring and prevention of adverse effects from pharmaceutical products, with particular focus on adverse drug reactions. Pharmacovigilance is linked to the CHM and the MHRA. Does this link ensure the safeguarding of our health is prioritised before the interests of the pharmaceutical company? Will pharmacovigilance fulfil all its safeguarding responsibilities, detailed in their terms of reference, is pharmacovigilance an improved process with effective safeguards in place to protect the population? <clears throat> or is it just a long word, which sounds impressive, yet is powerless to stop the same failures happening again today? <coughs> By failing to acknowledge, learn, and finally admit the gross failures of the past, there is no hope of trust for the future. <clears throat> I would like, pleased to know I'm sure, to end this 
by reading a few words specifically for our children. <clears throat> the world needs to wake up before it's too late to stop the collusion between pharma and state. We need to unite so that justice prevails, to see through the lies of governments who fail to protect our unborn, the innocent child, <clears throat> who didn't deserve the experiments allowed by pharmaceutical giants whose profits are gained despite fears expressed that their pills could contain drugs that could maim and even abort. Just keep pushing the pills, don't give it a thought. The WHO supported this action to refute all our fears as merely reaction. By a few medical experts, what did they know? Just to make sure the profits still flow. To ensure the success of a new pill in town dedicated to slowing the population down. Add to this mix our own health authorities, employed by us all the silent majorities. They make smoking in cars with very young children a matter of law and strictly forbidden. Yet for eight long lost years, they simply sat back and ignored all the warnings, just would not react to the pleas of our doctors, so desperate to show the results of research, but they didn't want to know. So how to understand when it states in black and white, the drug was contraindicated, which means it wasn't right. To be trialled by hopeful mothers, how much clearer could it be? <clears throat> They didn't care enough to stop it, so they gave the drug to me. Now we all, <coughs> excuse me, now we have to stop them and hit them where it hurts, in their greedy business pockets and their bloated corporate purse. The results of greed still haunt us, though many now have died, and the justice we are seeking, they continue to deny. As the ties are even closer between pharma and the state, the truth must never surface, though, for some it is too late. We continue in our struggle to find the reason why, but no one cares or even listens. <clears throat> and our children, they still die. The failures are still happening, but they're much more frequent now. With funding from the farmer, governments still will disavow. They can't afford to look too closely at the failures and the lies by big pharma and the governments who place profits before lives. <clears throat> So please wake up and listen to the dangers we all face from greedy pharmaceuticals and governments who will place the ruthless pursuit of profits before the health of our human race. Thank you. <laughs>